Are we live, Julia? Yeah. All right. Hey, guys, welcome to another VMware Code live stream uh, power session. Uh, my name is Eric Nelson, and I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi. As you can see by the slide, this is a repeat of a session I did in uh, at VMworld 2019, and I also did this at AWS reInvent, and uh, it has been popular, and so I thought I would uh, spend a little bit of time for people that didn't manage to make it into one of the labs uh, to spend some time talking about Raspberry Pis and what it takes to make Kubernetes run on Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm a senior director of social media communities at VMware, but I'm also an engineer at heart, and I am a VMware code coach. So, uh, and today I'm going to take you through a slow version of the presentation because I did a half an hour version of this presentation, and it goes very fast. So what I'm going to try to do today is go a little bit slower uh, on this. So the agenda for today will be kind of busy. There are a lot of things that you need to do in order to uh, get Kubernetes running on a Raspberry Pi. So we'll take you through the installing Kubernetes. Um, I'll, I'll do a little bit of overview of the Raspberry Pi because we have a little extra time today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sensors. Uh, I do have a Raspberry Pi here with me and I will spend some time talking about it and the sensor application that we would write in order to uh, have an application to run on Kubernetes because Kubernetes is an app deployment engine. Um, so you obviously would need an application to deploy uh, on your Kubernetes running on your Raspberry Pi. Uh, we'll talk about making a Docker image with an OS. You'll need that. Um, and then creating a pod definition for your Docker image and then running it all on your Raspberry Pi on your Kubernetes cluster. So that's the agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna spend an, an hour together uh, at taking you through how this works and maybe we'll get to zoom in on the Raspberry Pi a little bit at the same time. So a little bit about me before we get started. I'm a community guy. I like to get to know everyone. Um, I think we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 members uh, in the uh, code community now. And uh, I have probably met half of you guys. So always great to meet people. Uh, who, am, who am I and how did I get here? So uh, University of Florida, I did computer science and marketing in 1985. So that tells you how old I am. Um, I, I did a graduate classes in engineering at Stanford when I moved out to California. Uh, but before I moved to California, I actually worked at IBM in Boca Raton. And uh, my claim to frame there was I worked for the IBM Entry Systems Division, which actually built the PC XT AT. Uh, I worked in the business apps group and uh, we got a lot of fun building the original PC. Uh, so uh, we, we hired Bill Gates at the time. I was right out of college. So I was a young youngster at the time, uh, but I had a lot of fun working on software on the original PC, PC line. Uh, worked at a bunch of different companies then, left IBM. Uh, IBM moved back out to North Carolina. So I didn't, uh, I didn't, want, to, I didn't want to move to North Carolina. So uh, I, uh, I moved on to other places. Uh, Google Electronics, Kodak, PepsiCo, Sun Microsystems. I did some consulting with the US Navy, the Australian Navy, uh, different OS companies. So I spent uh, probably a six year stint uh, working as consultants, uh, con at consulting different companies, working on different software uh, pieces. So a lot of spent time spent in the software industry. Um, Founded a couple things. Big Admin was an administration website for Sun. It was the second largest uh, site. This was before websites showed up. Um, had a lot of fun doing that. Lots of traffic. Uh, made a thing called Flash Archive, which was, uh, if you knew Solaris, uh, FLAR, uh, CVF, and uh, XVF were Flash Archives. These were precursors to VMware's VMDKs. Uh, so VMware hadn't been invented yet, and we actually made archives of the entire operating system that could be moved from one system to another system. And that's before uh, VMware made a, a VM, uh, uh, VMDK. So uh, spent some time there. I created the vExpert program at VMware and I launched the VMware code program uh, here at VMware. So those are the kind of things that I've been building. Um, and then for fun, I, run, I ran bulletin boards in the 80s and 90s before the web was invented, where you would upload one thing, download 10 things. 
um, got my first SCO Unix and my first root password was back right after I left IBM. Uh, and that was on a six megahertz IBM AT. So I was really excited to get a root password for the very first time because going through college in computer science, you didn't get a root password. Um, so did that and then uh, fun things, UUCP to University of Miami, got my first mail field feed before mail was invented. Uh, and then um, my son uh, is actually a hardware engineer at Roku and uh, he's taught me a ton about soft, uh, hardware engineering. So now I can do both uh, kernel development, software development, as well as driver development. And now down at the hardware layer, I have learned a lot about hardware. So a lot of fun stuff. This is me. I run a weekly podcast. Every Wednesday is the VMware Community Podcast. Uh, my wife and Julia Klaus, who's doing the filming on this today. Hi, Julia. Uh, great to, great to, you know, we have her over for dinner now and then. Uh, this is my family, me and my son at the top. It works at Roku and his wife, my wife and my two boys and my daughter in the front. So that's who I am. So I'm a community guy. I love doing these kind of sessions. Uh, this is kind of a fun geeky session to make Kubernetes run on a Raspberry Pi. And then that's me as a young man with my uh, nephew who now is all grown up and has children of his own. So this is my life. This is who I am. All right. With that, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Eric and I pro. Uh, so away we go. So what is code? Before I get into code, you should go join code. If you happen to be watching this live stream or you're watching this uh, recorded later on. Um, go join Code. We have a calendar of code sessions. We are publishing every month. We publish more of the code sessions we're doing online. I know we have four scheduled for the month of May, uh, where they're all topics uh, for IT practitioners, for DevOps people, as well as for developers. So uh, we, we try to bring developers and IT practitioners together. Uh, that is our mission for code.vmware.com. So come join the program. We have 20,000 people. We have Slack channels. It's a members only, so you have to join the program to get invited to the Slack channels. We have hundreds of Slack categories and we have uh, thousands per week of people having conversations. So uh, a lot of the IT practitioners that are working on DevOps related technologies or their uh, power CLI technologies or their code, uh, they're all in there uh, engaging with one another, uh, not very much spam, so a good place to be. Um, and then we also uh, produce some labs and do labs as well. Uh, so we are now at 20,000 members. This is a slide from last year. We're continuing to grow and we would love to have you join. It's free to join code.vmware.com and just click on the join. Okay, now we get to the topic of Kubernetes. Uh, so what is Kubernetes? Um, Kubernetes, if, you do, if, you, if you're new to this, and this is you know, a fun place where we're going to be talking about Raspberry Pi. So let me just tell you kind of Kubernetes is another deployment engine. Right? It's another tool to automate the deployment of your workloads. Um, so these, to these tools uh, are very common, Chef, Puppet, Jenkins. Uh, these are all tools that have been out there. Uh, Kubernetes was open sourced by Google. So Google basically built another engine. Anytime you do a Google search, you're actually using Kubernetes. Uh, they do micro little tasks for each and every search. So if you ever watch Google present their, their Kubernetes architecture, they're literally doing hundreds of thousands of, of Kubernetes deployments uh, every minute because every single search gets packaged up and delivered to a, a tiny microserver uh, that's in Iraq to do the search and then send back the results. Um, so this is no different. It's a tool that Google has produced to bundle up your workload and deploy it. Um, DevOps tools are traditionally driven by markup languages. So this is a, this, this Kubernetes has a markup language. It's called YAML, yet another markup language, Y-A-M-L. Many of you have heard of YAML. Uh, it uses YAML to define how to deploy your payload into production. Uh, Kubernetes is also a container orchestration and management application uh, which will interact with Docker that will deliver the payload, right? So in a container format, which is a small operating system with your application bundled up, it'll be delivered down to uh, a server and run in a container. And you ask yourself, 
all right, I've heard of containers. Maybe you're new to containers. Maybe uh, you haven't spent time with any of this. A container is basically a Unix Linux scheduler construct that lets you run processes in isolation on an operating system. In most cases, 99% of the cases, it's on Linux. But other Unixes have containers. Containers have been around uh, since the 80s when Unix was became popular. Um, there was always a container construct in the scheduler that allowed you to isolate things and run them. Um, VMware implemented VMDKs, which, you know, basically another way to isolate with a hypervisor, isolate what's running, um, but containers were always in Linux and you could always do that. Uh, so a container is there and now what, uh, what Docker does is Docker bundles up that uh, container uh, and delivers it. They, they actually deliver it as a tar file, which is the old format called tape archive retrieval. Uh, uh, which was used with the dual spinning tape drives in the day. Uh, I, I've used those in the past where you could read and write streaming files onto a, a tape subsystem. Uh, the tar file, the format has stayed with us as part of the original Unix and now Linux. Um, and uh, what, when we deliver a Docker image, we're delivering a tar file of a micro OS plus your application bundled together in a tar file that is delivered down to uh, Kubernetes and then untarred, unpacked, unzipped, as we would say, and then deliver. And then the last thing is Git and GitHub. We should just talk about these terms. Git and GitHub is a, a source repository, uh, much like the old re source repository, SCCS, source code control system, which was part of uh, Unix and Linux in the old days. Uh, it's just a newer version, a better, better functionality. Uh, we've had at least five major uh, source repository systems in my career since the 1980s, uh, which is now 40 years, I guess. Um, so Git and GitHub. GitHub is just a website. Git is the actual technology that you can install on your laptop or install on any server that does the source management, tree management. And then GitHub is actually just a web service. So this is kind of good to see that um, all these terms kind of layer together to build you a modern day Kubernetes uh, deployment model. And we're gonna be looking at each one of these as we, as we bundle up our, our workload and deploy it on a Raspberry Pi. So VMware has Kubernetes. Uh, we used to have Enterprise PKS. I think we've rebranded all of this now, and we now just call it Tanzu. And Tanzu is a portfolio of products that allow you to deploy Kubernetes. Um, and recently, and we announced Kubernetes in vSphere. So vSphere will actually just run Kubernetes. If you install the right version of vSphere, you will have a Kubernetes embedded in your hypervisor, which you can then deploy your Kubernetes workloads right onto vSphere as opposed to bundling an operating system with your application payload uh, and then having it de deployed down onto your Raspberry Pi that's running Kubernetes, you can actually just deploy that right to vSphere. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that today, but uh, having fun with the Raspberry Pi should set you up uh, to understand what you would need to be doing if you were gonna deploy your workload uh, onto, onto vSphere directly. And there are some great labs on how to do that as well. So installing uh, Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi, let's just get right into it now. Um, so we have Raspberry Pis. Uh, we did this on Raspberry Pi 3B pluses, uh, or you can do it with 3Bs or 3B pluses. The, uh, the plus just means it has Wi-Fi on it. So this is the Raspberry Pi uh, 3. I'll hold it in front of the camera. It has a gig of memory on it. Um, it has an ARM four core processor. Uh, these sell for like $35 on Amazon. So if you want to build a Kubernetes cluster node, you would, you would absolutely need two of these, and I would say three, just to be safe. So you would have two nodes, worker nodes, and a master node. Um, and we made this work on a, this Raspberry Pi 3, which has a one gig of, one gig of memory on it. Um, it also has USB ports, uh, USB, hardline Ethernet. The B Plus has... Wi-Fi Ethernet has an HDMI connector uh, and it has uh, power with USB 1.0, uh, five volt USB power is plan, has audio. So you can use this guy as a full desktop if you want. Uh, we're make, making them microservers here uh, for, for this case. 
uh, we're going to put an operating system on here. Um, the operating system that you need on this Raspberry Pi 3, and I will take a moment to say, even though we did use the Raspberry Pi 3 to install Kubernetes, you can install Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, because the Raspberry Pi 4s can go have, I think, up to four gig memory. We got a two gig of memory Raspberry Pi 4 and made it a master server. When you listen to Google online and you read the forms, you'll see that they don't recommend running Kubernetes master server on anything less than four gig of memory. Um, we made it work on a one gig of memory Raspberry Pi 3. So if you have some old threes lying around, you can make it work. Um, but you can also use a, a Raspberry Pi 4. A Raspberry Pi 4 has very similar configuration, um, but they I think they sell for $50 or $48 now. And you can get a two gig or four gig model. If you're gonna go buy a new Raspberry Pi 4 to do this project, definitely get a four gig model because Kubernetes master server likes to have more memory uh, running on it. Once you get your Raspberry Pi, you have to put an operating system on it. We did this with generic uh, Raspbian OS. Um, you don't need anything special. You can just use the standard Raspberry Pi OS that can be do downloaded off a uh, uh, off of raspberrypi.org. I don't know what the URL is, but you can just go Google it and download the standard Raspberry Pi OS, vanilla OS. You do need to enable SSH on this guy um, in order to uh, in order to SSH in. Uh, so when you do the OS install, they they give you a little admin menu. You can go in and you can enable SSH as a service, so you can SSH in. Uh, they have a cute little wizard that'll do that. Um, you have to set up static IP addresses. So in this diagram, you'll notice that we have a master server, which is one Raspberry Pi, either three or four. And then we have two, three worker nodes, which are Raspberry Pi 3B pluses. The worker nodes have no problem running on a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, and this is what we're gonna set up as a three node. You can do this with just a master node and a client. You don't need multiple nodes in order to run Kubernetes and experience it and write your YAML files and run applications if you're just doing this for a home lab experiment. You have to set static IP addresses. Um, you have to set uh, DNS. Um, you have to set up your default routes so that uh, the machines uh, will know of each other on a network. So you will need a hub. You will have probably want to turn a firewall off on the hub so that all the nodes can connect to each other. Um, that's a, an important piece. Um, so let's see, you'll need an SD card. That's where you put the storage. So the uh, 16 gig SD card, micro SD card is fine. Switch and obviously some cables. So uh, most of us have enough of this, these little nid bits in our, our home buckets that we should be able to pull some cables out. As long as you have a 60, 16 gig card with a power supply. And I think you can buy the Raspberry Pi 3 kit for like $42 that has the power supply, an SD card, and a Raspberry Pi 3, and you'll be in business. You will need a keyboard, uh, a mouse, and a, a, a typical HDMI display with an HDMI cable. They have a standard big format HDMI cable connector on your Raspberry Pi. Um, you'll need a second one for your Pi node. Uh, you don't need multiple keyboards and mice if you don't want to. You can just share one back and forth uh, because once you get it up and running, it's, it's up and running, you're, you're good to go. Um, so you install a standard OS, enable SSH, you're good to go. Next, you need to install Docker. You'll need to disable swap, uh, set up a repo on Kubernetes and install Kubernetes. So we'll show you some of these commands as, as we're moving forward here. So this is the a script that we, we have written um, and we'll make these slides available on the code website. Um, but you can run this script. This script basically sets up your uh, static IP addresses as well, uh, so that you, you have a network. Um, and we did this with our, our master node plus our three worker nodes. So we have master, and the, which is our master node. And we've just given it local IP addresses um, uh, where I pass, I run the script, I set the name, and then I set the IP address and I set the route. So my route for this would be uh, 192.168.1.1. Um, my main IP address for my master server would be 192.168.1.10. And then my 
Sleepy, Doc, and Grumpy, which are my worker nodes, will be set to 20, 21, and 22, right? Uh, 198, 160, 192, 168, 1 dot, 20, 21, and 22. Uh, they all go through my main hub. So this is a simple single hub, a static defined uh, network, uh, all on 192, 168, 1 dot. And then uh, one is the hub IP address. And then 10 is my master node, 20, 21, 22 are my worker nodes. And when I run these, uh, they will actually uh, define that for us to find the route, uh, set DNS uh, to, the, to, the, to your hub. So in a real sense, you'll probably want uh, this connected to the internet. You'll need this connected to the internet because we're gonna pull things off, off of Docker hub. Um, so that your hub 192.168.1.1 needs to be set up for uh, connected to the Ethernet, in Ethernet or the internet, uh, so that you can get out, uh, and it should have DNS running on it. So it should be a smart hub that has DNS running on it. Uh, then everything will pass DNS back to your hub, and your routes will be defined and so forth. And this is uh, the script that we have that we run um, in order to set up our network. I would say any questions, except I'm not watching the chat right now, so we'll just continue on. Um, we do have a little bit of the script here, uh, installing Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi. So once I've installed my operating system and I've set up my networks, I actually have to then install um, both a Docker, I have to disable swap, and I have to go install Kubernetes. Um, and so this slide is a little bit uh, misformatted. I think it might be Zoom oriented, um, but I will I will go through the, the script at the top and then take you through what's actually happening. And so this script will actually just go set up your machine. It's gonna go install Docker first. You need Docker installed in order to download your Docker images, which will show you how to uh, create a Docker image and upload it on, onto Docker. So you'll be able to create a Docker account. Uh, if you create a Docker account, you can uh, upload a Docker image, we'll show you that. But first thing first, on your, on your Raspberry Pi, uh, you'll want to do this, and you'll want to do this on all the nodes, on the master node and the worker nodes. So if you're having three worker nodes, uh, you're gonna wanna run that network script on all of the nodes, and you're gonna wanna run th this installing um, Docker, uh, setting up Kubernetes uh, on each of these nodes as well, and disabling swap. Why do we disable, disable swap? Because Kubernetes on a Raspberry Thri Pi 3 runs in about 500 megabytes or maybe 700 megabytes, which means that you only got about 100 meg for the operating system and that's about it. So if you don't have swap disabled, um, this will not run very well. Um, so you, you'll definitely want to uh, run this install script uh, on the master node uh, in disable swap on the master node so that um, this you won't, uh, if you start swapping, you're gonna time on Kubernetes initialization. So when Kubernetes initializes, um, it'll time out if you don't have swap disabled. So we disable swap in the script. So just going through the script, first thing is we go get, we use curl to go get uh, Docker and, 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 and bring it down. Um, so we go get Docker and bring it down locally onto the machine. Um, we actually disable swap. So there is the, the lines to disable swap and become root and we actually just disable swap in there. Um, and then we set it up so that during reboot, uh, your swap will continue to be disabled. If you don't do that, every time you reboot, uh, Kubernetes master might not run. And in fact, the Kubernetes, when it launches, uh, it'll auto launch once you install it, no matter how many times you reboot. But if your swap isn't disabled, Kubernetes spits out an error line saying, go disable your swap, please. So it won't even run these days without disabling swap. Um, so we, uh, we, we add a repo so that we can go install Kubernetes. Um, so we just use a standard uh, uh, installer to install Kubernetes, a uh, standard installer for uh, Raspberry. Um, and then we go pull down the Kubernetes package. Uh, and we pull down that package and we actually uh, get updates to, to the package um, so that we actually have it. And then we install the package. I know it's overrun here on the slide, but sudo, sudo apt get install 
and then Cube ADM. So that's the installing the Cube ADM packages, uh, which will actually put Kubernetes packages on your machine. So in a sense, we've gotten Docker, we've disabled Swap, and we've pulled down Kubernetes from Google. We're just getting the generic compiled open source Kubernetes packages for Raspberry Pi and installing them directly on the machine. Once you've installed this on your master node, and this is just us running this on the master node, but we'll also run this script on the, on the client node as well, on all the worker nodes. Um, once you've run that to install Kubernetes, um, you want to just run uh, shell install.sh. And installing.sh will actually in, uh, run this install script. So this install script is called install.sh, which will go do that. Once I've done that, I've installed Kubernetes. Now I have to initialize Kubernetes. Now initializing Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi 3 as a master node um, is tricky. If you don't have a uh, just if you haven't disabled swap, it won't work. Um, if you have a GUI on this um, and you're running it as a desktop, shut down the desktop because it's going to need all the memory it can get in order to get through the install process quick enough. Right. The other thing that we noticed is if you have a slow SD card, you will time out on a Kubernetes install on a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, the SD card. They have an ultra SD card from uh, San SanDisk. SanDisk has a regular, it has an ultra. If you look at the ultra, the speed is like 60% faster, uh, the read write speed, and you'll want that SD card that's 60% faster. Um, so definitely get yourself uh, a fast SAN card for your worker node. If you're on a Raspberry Pi 4, you probably want a fast SD, micro SD card. They're all micro SD cards, by the way, not full SD cards, micro SDs. You'll want a fast micro SD card on either one. Uh, it'll just help, it'll help everything boot faster, it'll run faster, uh, and you won't tend to time. We spent about a week when we were doing this project uh, getting through that timeout, realizing that we had a slow SAN SD card. Uh, so that's uh, important to know. I run Cube ADM in it, and you're good to go. It will take about 10 minutes to initialize. It does a lot of setup to initialize Kubernetes on your worker node. Once it's done, if it didn't time out and you fail, if it times out and you see errors, most likely it's just timed out. Otherwise, it's fairly reliable. Uh, the only issues we had with this was timeout. If it succeeds at the end, it'll say congratulations or it says something positive. And then it gives you your security keys. You will need your security keys in order to uh, talk securely from your master node to your worker nodes. So it encrypts the communication between your worker node and your master node and the security keys, it will spit those out. If you don't, do the worker nodes on the same day, the security keys will time out after 24 hours. There is a kubeadm get key command that you can run that'll just give you new keys. So if once you've used those keys, they don't time out, then you can leave your nodes up and running and they never time out. But it, when it gives you those keys, you have to use them within 24 hours. So again, that was the master node. Worker node, it's the same process. Um, uh, you, you actually will run the install um, and then you will run a join command that is given to you with that key at the, at the time that your master node uh, finished. So your master node finishes and it gives you a join command right there. It says, congratulations. And then it gives you a join command with the secure key. You want to just go run uh, that join command. It'll be kubeadm join and it'll give you the token. That's all it's really giving you in that join command. So you want to go get that key and go uh, run that uh, on your wor each worker node. And that worker node will take another three to five minutes to join. Um, sometimes it can take up to three hours to join, depending on whether there is a network issue. We have seen that a couple times. This, again, is a home lab project. Uh, but feel free. It'll run. When you're done, um, you can run on your master node, kube control, get nodes. And you will see 
ready states for each of your uh, worker nodes. That means you've successfully installed the Kubernetes. Notice a couple notes, your versions, they all have to be the same. You cannot have uh, Kubernetes versions different. So when you're installing, you have to keep your worker nodes and your muster nodes all on the same version of Kubernetes. Okay, I will take a break just for a second here. I don't have any questions texted to me, so I am good to go. So now we're going to uh, build an application. Again, when you're doing Kubernetes on Raspberry Pi, you want an application. Um, you're the whole point is to deploy an application. Um, the fun thing about Raspberry Pis is that they have cool applications you can build. Um, we did a, a fun lab at VMworld where we actually had sensors uh, that we wired onto the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and there are, uh, I think, a handful of sensors that we built here. Uh, one is a digital touch sensor that basically allows you to touch uh, the sensor and you, know, you can write code and we'll show you the code that looks for that touch and then uh, you, know, you can display something in, in that touch. We have a DHT11, which is a atmospheric uh, humidity and temperature sensor. So barometric pressure, humidity, uh, that's the BMP. This one is a uh, humidity and, and temperature sensor, I believe, the DHT11. We have an infrared motion sensor. Anything moves in a room, that'll go off. We have a little OLED display that displays uh, graphics. So if you have the digital touch, you can write out code that will write, I, I saw you touch me or whatever. So a little display sensor as well as a, a BMP 280 sensor, which is barometric pressure, temperature, and I think humidity. So it does all three of those. So these are kind of sensors you can get for Raspberry Pis, which are fun. If you're doing a home project, uh, we're gonna write some Python code here, or at least show you some Python code that will help you um, decide application you wanna write. You do have to write a application. So just for a second, because this is a Raspberry Pi, we'll talk a little bit about the pinouts on a Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi has all these connectors on them. There are a bunch of pins. Uh, and you can see we have the diagram here of all the pins. So uh, this pin is a header that, that starts at pin one. If you have the HDMI port facing down, uh, the, the header is on the top and the pins go from left to right. Uh, pin one is the very uh, bottom uh, left corner and then and go so forth. We have I2C sensor pins, uh, which allow you to have I2C sensors. That's a protocol that is used to talk uh, to I2C sensors. So the barometric pressure is an I2C sensor. It talks a protocol. It's a bus protocol. Um, we also have UART lines. We have spy lines. We have uh, EE prom lines, and then all the other pins are just uh, GPIO lines, which allow you to connect a sensor directly to any of those pins. So the touch sensor is an easy one. If uh, I can connect it to any of the GPIO pins, so for instance, GPIO uh, 25 is pin number 22, I could hook one end to the sensor to the GPIO pin, uh, another to power and another to ground. And then I could just read, is there a high voltage on GPIO 22? If there's a high voltage on GPIO 22 or GPIO 25, which is pin 22, if I read that and there's high voltage, it means there's a press. So all the GPIO pins, you're just gonna read or write, read to see if there's data there or not. Uh, either there's a high voltage there or there isn't. Uh, so that's what I would say uh, are all these pins. Uh, I have a, a, a sensor presentation that I do that talks in detail about the sensors and the pinouts. This isn't that. This is just uh, allowing you to build an application. Go learn how to write a, a Raspberry Pi application if you don't know. Um, maybe we'll do a code session on that again. Again, uh, I2C sensors, uh, we, we use the, uh, the, the barometric pressure sensor that talks on an address. Um, I'm going to skip kind of through a lot of this. This is diving deep into how to write your sensor application. Um, but the I2C sensors are address-driven sensors. I can have a lot of them hanging off uh, two of the wires. 
and the, the two wires are pin number three and five on the on this pinout. And that will allow me to have up to 128 different sensors hanging on those two pins, and they all just have their own address. So we talk a little bit about the address uh, of each of these sensors. The BMP280 uh, has a an address, uh, I think it's 5C or 3C. We'll get into the code and see what that looks like. And so this is the code um, that for a small application that would look at the GPIO, uh, the, the sensor, the BMP280 sensor, and it would, uh, it'll print out the temperature and pressure and altitude of, of, of the sensor. So if you get a BMP280, this code will work for you. Uh, I'm not gonna dive deep into the code, um, but this is the code they will basically go read the sensor data uh, and it will actually print that sensor data out to the little OLED display, which is a cute little one inch by one inch OLED display. Uh, they work very nicely they, and they will print out your data. Um, you could write the Python code and just do printfs or prints. They will print out that, that data directly to the shell terminal and from which you ran it. But if you have a, uh, this, without a head, you can get these little OLED displays for like $7 on Amazon. Uh, they're just, you can you look up 0.96 OLED display, 0.96 inch OLED display, and you can use this code. And this code is on the internet. You can go look at um, GitHub KC Sound uh, and BMP display. He has that uh, code in GitHub. You can go get this code and download it. We also have code examples for all of the other displays, so or all the other sensors. So if you wanted to go get the code, you can go look at Casey Sounds GitHub repository. He has code for the touch. Uh, he has code for the DHT11. And he has code for the infrared, and he has this code for the BMP280. So these are nice little applications that'll run and go get the sensor code. You do have to wire the sensors properly. And I think that on that slide example, uh, we do show you what pins to use. Um, you can change those pins if you want to, but then you'll have to change the code that you get off of the GitHub repository. So that's enough of the application. Assuming I write a Python application uh, for this sensor, I can use that, uh, that application. But to deploy it on through Kubernetes, you actually have to take that application and make a Docker image, which is why we needed to talk about building a Python application. That's all Python code, um, and you will need Python installed on your operating system in order to run Python. So Python is by default installed, but in the case of creating a Docker image, uh, the Raspberry Pi OS is about two gig of size, 1.6 gigabytes. When you're deploying your application through Kubernetes, you wanna make it as small as possible. So you really want to have a stripped down micro kernel and you might hear of micro OSs and they have a micro OS for ARM based uh, systems such as Raspberry Pi. And so you'll want to go get a stripped down ARM OS that might be in the neighborhood of 70 megabytes, right? So that way, when you're deploying your application, you're not pulling down two gig of, of operating system every time you want to deploy to a new node. Kubernetes allows you to deploy once and then it'll remember, so it won't try to pull everything down unless it's been refreshed. So there is that, but still you want a microkernel. So in this case, um, we wanted to grab a microkernel which doesn't have anything in it, not even Python, but then we want to add Python. We want to make sure that we're choosing a microkernel that has Python. So when creating your Docker image, how do you create a Docker image? You make a Docker file. And this is an example of a small Docker file that we've created. Um, and we show you how to make that Docker file and then upload it to Docker Hub. So you can then deploy your Docker image down to a Raspberry Pi. And we're gonna do that command without using Kubernetes. So this step is define your Docker file, make a simple Docker file, upload it to Docker Hub, and then use Docker to pull it down and deploy it to your Raspberry Pi. 
If you've done that successfully, it should run. The app should light up your OLED display or your Python code should run and do whatever it's supposed to do. Um, and you can test that before we try to make it run in Kubernetes. So at this point, we're just trying to manually create a Docker image, run it manually, upload it to Docker Hub, and then run it manually to test to make sure that your Docker image works. So let's look at the Docker file. The Docker file, it, we're saying, let's build a Docker image from, and then we use Docker, uh, Docker Hub, um, where we just go pull an ARM image, which they have up there, which is an ARM 32-bit uh, V7 with a Python 3 stretch, which means go get me a simple ARM microkernel with uh, Python. So we had to go look that up because we needed an ARM image that was pre-built, uh, operating system that was pre-built that had Python on it. And they have such things. They have a bunch of different options for pulling down ARM images. So, and then we added our application uh, and we added it from the local directory. So when we create this Docker image in the local directory where we run the creation command, uh, we're going to put our app, which in this case is bmpdisplay.py, which is for Python. Once uh, we've said, here's the operating system, we actually want to, when the operating system deploys, we want to run uh, the setup tools. So we're going to uh, run a pip installer, a pip is an installer, install, and then we're gonna uh, run the setup tools. Uh, so that's something that's going to do when the operating system first gets uh, installed. Uh, we're also gonna get updates to the, to the operating system. So we know their update. Uh, we're going to run uh, an install. So once we've gone and installed them, we're going to go run uh, the setup tools, and we're going to install uh, the Adafruit library for the SSD 1306. The SSD 1306 is this little display. So not only do we have to have our Python libraries, we have to have our Python application. We also have to have the display library. Uh, so we're telling it to install the OLED display library as part of this install process for the operating system. Um, so we're going to do that. We're also going to install the BMP280 library. The BMP280 is the uh, barometric pressure sensor. It's a Texas Instruments uh, sensor. They've done a Python library for the, that Texas Instruments sensor. It's standard. So we want to install that uh, library for the BMP280, the Python library for that. Um, so now our microkernel will have uh, the setup tools installed. It'll install the Adafruit library. It's got Python installed, and it's going to have the Python library for the BMP280 installed. Um, and th those are that's going to be what is going to be installed. Oh, and Pillow. Pillow is an image library that allows you to draw uh, images on that little OLED display. So our application uses uh, image libraries to display to draw graphics on that little OLED display. And so those are the things you need, microkernel, Python, setup tools, the Adafruit library, the BMP280 library, and the image library, Pillow. All those things get installed and set up and run when you pull your Docker image down from Docker Hub. Um, those get uh, set up. Um, and then once the operating system is booted, we actually want to run a command, which is our application. So we run to run Python space BMP display Python, which is our application. So now this whole bundle gets bundled up as a Docker file, uploaded, and when when we download that from Docker, that'll all happen, and we'll have an operating system that fires off on the Raspberry Pi and runs in a uh, container that will actually run our application. So uh, first I have to build my Docker image. So I say a sudo docker build minus T and then give it my build, my Docker file name, right? And it will actually go ahead and build that, uh, our Docker image. We named it BMP-DISP for BMP display. And that will be an operating system with everything in it and the libraries and the, our application itself, which will get fired off whenever you boot it. So that's kind of a Docker image ready to go. Uh, can we build that? 
it'll make a file and then we want to go forward and upload that file uh, to our Docker Hub repository. You would need to make your own Docker Hub repository. Docker Hub is free, you can go get a free account, set that free account up and you will be ready to go. Uh, once you've, uh, you can tag it with your name. Um, uh, so that's the BMP dash display. Um, then I can go ahead and push that up to my repository. Uh, and then I can check to make sure everything is there by just going to my repository and looking. So in this case, your repository name with your name of your repository there. And you can see that you've uploaded an image uh, there that is there. We actually have, I think, all of these images uh, uploaded to a code repository. Um, I don't think we have the URL here, but VMware Code, I think, is the name of our repository. So uh, if you go to VMware Code, you can look there, and we actually have Docker images for these payloads put up on the VMware Code uh, Docker Hub repository. If you want to test to make sure you've done all these steps correctly, you can run sudo docker run and then privilege dash dash privilege uh, your docker repository in this case vmware code code and then uh, the name the tag is the name of your build which in this case was uh, bmp dash ds disp for bmp disk display um, if you've done everything properly that should run on your local raspberry pi you run that on your local raspberry pi it should pull down the image and actually run that um, and so that's uh, that's that's what that's sh what should happen. Um, actually, the repository is BMP dash display, and the tag is the version number. So in this case, V one, um, and it will go download that application and run that. And uh, and if that works, then you're in good shape. This means that you've created a Docker image. It's ready to go. You've tested it. Your application downloads and runs. Notice that we put dash dash privileged. The Raspberry Pi requires the operating system to run in privilege mode to be able to get at the pins. The pin is a security exception, uh, uh, be able to get at the hardware pins running in a container. And so you uh, you need to run that container in privilege mode in order for it to be able to read and write data f directly from pins on the server, uh, which the Raspberry Pi is a little server. So we pass in the privilege mode into Docker Hub in order to do that. So we've now made it through making your Docker image. Now we're into Kubernetes, right? We've installed Kubernetes. We have Kubernetes running. Uh, we've done the uh, kubeadm control, which shows us that our pods are up and running, ready to take workloads. We have now defined a workload. We now have to make a YAML file that declares, go get this workload. And here are the parameters for which to deploy this workload onto one of our worker nodes. Um, so we will do that. I'm going to do a time check here to make sure we don't completely run over. I think we still have 10 more minutes, which I think is good because that's about what we're going to need to do these last couple of steps. They're actually really not that hard. So uh, now that most of the work here is building your app and doing all the configuration install on your Raspberry Pis. Now that we've got things up and running, um, it's much easier to just make a YAML file. So first thing I would say about a YAML file, yet another markup language, um, straightforward. Um, we're going to make the bmp-sensor.yaml file. Um, this you give to Kubernetes on your master node, and it will take that workload and then start managing that workload. Um, and YAML file editing is a whole career, I think, or I think, you could take probably a week long class in uh, learning YAML constructs. This is a very simple uh, hello world YAML file uh, that you can, you can learn and uh, I'll take you through what that looks like. So I'm going to make a YAML file, which is purpose is to interact with Kubernetes to be able to pull down my uh, Docker hub image and deploy it to one of the work nodes. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. Worker nodes is uh, considered, uh, my application is called a pod. The pod is a set of applications that will deploy, be deployed out to nodes. The pod is not a definition of the nodes. The pod is the definition of the application from which you're going to deploy to sets of nodes. 
Um, so in this case, I'm defining this YAML file as a application. An application could be a complex application that has you know, Python code as well as database uh, expectations, dependencies on uh, a, a bunch of microservices. So this is only one microservice, but a pod could be a definition of 30 microservices all bundled together that then get deployed out to worker nodes simultaneously. Um, in this case, this is a very hello world, single YAML file definition of a pod that will have one job, which is to run the BMP280 code on a node. So uh, API version V1, that's just an API definition. Um, we're just using the V1 version, which is straightforward. Um, we're saying this is a pod definition of a workload. Um, we have to give it a name. Uh, so the name is going to be BMP-DISP for display. So when I'm running this and I'm seeing workloads, that'll be the workload name that will be running. Uh, then I have to give it specifications. Um, I want to... Uh, assign this to a work node. We were running these labs in, at lab tables. So if you sat down and you were on Dopey or, or Sleepy, um, you, you could put a node name in there and Kubernetes will send it to that node name. Normally Kubernetes would just pick an, an open uh, node and deploy it to the most open node in the, in the, in the group of, of nodes. Uh, in this case, that would be awkward because somebody would be sitting next to you with a node and your job would be auto deployed to that node. So in this case, uh, we're going to give it a node name, which is Sleepy, which means it'll go run on Sleepy. One other aside, when you're writing YAML files, YAML is extremely case and position sensitive. So uh, make, make sure that you have things correctly tabs. Uh, have to be aligned. It, it, it's tab sensitive. If you move things around, if you're not in order, those tabs, like Python, tabs have meaning of structure. They don't put curly braces around things. They use the syntax and the positioning to equal syntax. So make sure you have this exact one. When doing labs, when people were home typing these YAML files, 99% of people would not be able to make it work in the first 10 minutes because they had missed characters. They had a space past the colon. They had a tab where there wasn't supposed to be a tab. So it is sensitive to indentation as well as spaces, as well as capital versus uh, lowercase. So understand that when you're doing YAML file uh, editing. In this case, no names containers. We're, we're making a container. Um, we're going to pull from uh, Docker Hub. So it defaults to Docker Hub, and we're going to pull VMware code BMP280 colon V1. So if you have uh, your system going, uh, you could actually take this YAML file and just pull our workloads directly from VMware code because we do have them uploaded. Image policy says, if your worker node doesn't have this payload already on it, then pull it down. Uh, if it's there, you save needing to pull that image down unless the image has changed. It'll look to see if the image has changed. If, it, if it's not present or if it's changed, it'll pull it down. That helps speed up uh, deployments. Uh, obviously, you don't have to pull uh, 100 meg down every time. Uh, you just pull them down to your worker nodes once, and as long as things haven't changed, you'll be in good shape. Security, we had to do a security override, again, because we're referencing the pins on a Raspberry Pi. So we had to add sysadmin, uh, and then we had to uh, give privilege true and allow privilege escalation true. This allows uh, this payload to access the pins on the Raspberry Pi. That's basically it. That's your hello world for a YAML file. Um, now that I have that YAML file, I can go to my master node and create a job create a, a job using the, the YAML file definition. And I'm just gonna say cube control, uh, create minus F, which is say I'm going to pass in a file, BMP sensor.yaml. And that will do it. That will fire off on your master node this job. It usually takes maybe 30 seconds to a minute for it to come back. Um, then you can go look at your status, cube ADM control, uh, uh, get pods, you can see the pods that are actually out there running, you can see the list of jobs that are running on your uh, on your 
worker nodes. Um, so they'll say ready. Uh, it, back earlier, I had a slide that shows the ready nodes, but it'll actually have a job listed of what's actually running on the on the actual nodes. So, or you can go get cube control get. If you want to get a, a later description of what's the status of the job, um, error, error messages and so forth, you can go, uh, go, go, go look at logs, cube control logs with, uh, with the job name, or you can actually uh, ask a little more information about the job, which is cube control describe pods BMP display, tell you a little bit more about the, the job, when it got fired off, how long it's been running, that kind of stuff. So you can get uh, the cube control get pods just gives you one line. Cube control describe pods gives you maybe ten lines, and then the log file gives you all kinds of stuff that's happening with your with your workload. If your app has a bug, um, it'll crash, and uh, you will have to see that crash report by going and looking at the logs. So that's kind of the what you need to do to run a payload on um, on a Raspberry Pi, and this is. Uh, Hello world of YAML files. So this is just us. This is the actual code uh, that we wrote for that. Um, and we just give it to you in text format and then kind of give you the, the, the summary of all of the areas in that YAML file. And then these are the actual YAML, uh, the, the actual um, Docker images that we have out on code. Uh, VMware code, your sensor, your sensor can be BMP280, V1, infrared, V2, DHT11, V1, and digital touch, colon, V1. I would say go to the GitHub repository for KC Sound and uh, look at the code. Um, also, the pinouts, uh, how we're connecting the pins, the pin numbers are actually in the Python code. So if you want to rewire your sensors to different locations, the Python code is good to go look at, re, you know, look at what pin they're on, uh, and then, you know, uh, then create your Docker image and use your own repository. But we do put our own repository out there, so it's good. All right, so that's uh, that's the that's that. Um, you can deploy your YAML file onto your uh, if you have a terminal on your master node uh, with keyboard. You know you can obviously SCP your master file from your Mac or from anywhere. You don't have to be sitting on the actual master node. So we give you kind of some SCP commands to actually copy your YAML file over to a server, SSH in, and then go run that if you want to. So. Um, that's what that slide is talking about. Uh, we created a, a lab, uh, and these were passwords for the labs. Um, so you can see that. Extra things are nice to know. I wanted to get to this slide. This is the last slide as we come up to the top of the hour. Um, if you're messing with Raspberry Pis and you want to see whether device is actually connected, um, I2C detect will give you uh, kind of like a probe SCSI command. It'll show you what uh, devices are on your I2C bus. That's a nice command to know. Python minus V will show you the version of the libraries that are loaded uh, in Python. Python allows you to install libraries all over the place and set your paths, uh, kind of like LD library path and C. Uh, Python minus V, it's nice to see what libraries you're actually running. You download these libraries from various places doing testing. That's kind of nice to know. Python libraries are installed in user live Python 2.7 or whatever version of Python you're running. Um, you can reinstall libraries by just running uh, python setup.py install. It'll install a new library right on top of the old library. So if you want to reinstall libraries, if you want to hack libraries, Python is readable. You can just go edit the libraries directly. So um, you can change default pins. Some things that are interesting there. Uh, you can change your Python paths in your Python code so that uh, you can set up your own library paths and put your own libraries in your own library paths. That's kind of nice. Uh, if you ever wanted to make more display graphics, uh, you can create BPMs and they have a nice little library that will display BPMs. Uh, well, if you're using Photoshop, you can't make a, uh, oh, sorry, a PPM you have to write a BPM and then convert it to PPM. That's just a nice thing if you're interested in that. Some more library paths. Um, the address for your, um, 
your OLED display is 0x3C. Uh, you can uh, change your address. Some they have a they have a trans a, a resistor on the back that you can solder off on your OLED display and change the address. You can shift the resistor from uh, one position to another position, and it'll change the address. So if you wanted to run dual-headed OLED displays on your Raspberry Pi, uh, that's how you do that. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of the, some cheat sheets. Nice to know things that we discovered when we were playing with Raspberry Pis to do this project. Um, some other questions, some other, you know, kind of places, go join code.vmware.com on the, the code website. Um, we have these slides uh, up on the code website. You can search for them. Uh, we, we publish them. We also now this on the code, uh, this presentation on the code website. Um, there's where the GitHub is. So if you go get your, uh, the source, the Python source, to all of those four or five sensors, you can go get them on KC Sound. Um, other Python examples are fun uh, to go do. So where we got some of the source for some of these labs, you can go look for those. Um, yeah, other, other labs that are out there. Um, Sensor links, if you are into Raspberry Pi, you can go get a bunch of different sensors that are out there. I give you a top 50 sensors link. Uh, so if you're interested, they have some really cool sensors out there uh, that are fun to use. Uh, there is a home circuit you can buy to do home automation, turn your lights off and on, uh, do all kinds of little projects. Uh, we like to give away those sensors at the home labs that we do. Uh, you can go get those off, off of Amazon for like $25. So for like $100, give or take, um, maybe $150, you can have a multi-node Raspberry Pi environment that you can do fun projects with at the same time. Learn a little bit about uh, Kubernetes and start doing uh, your YAML file education. Because when you're talking about Kubernetes, understanding uh, uh, the YAML file syntax in order to do more complicated deploys is one of the things that you're going to want to learn in order to do this in production environments with vSphere 7. So that's pretty much the run through on what it takes to run uh, a home lab for 150 bucks, uh, running uh, and having a lot of fun with that. And the beautiful thing about these Raspberry Pis is that they, they don't take any uh, fan. You don't need a power supply, uh, a fan. Um, they you run super low voltage uh, amps, like uh, two amps, five volts. That's uh, two times so 10 watts or less. So they don't need a fan, they're, they're quiet. So you can have your, your Kubernetes lab environment running on a maybe 13 watts or 20, 15 watts uh, with no noise. So uh, they're simple, quiet and cheap, uh, which, which is not intrusive for anybody that wants to just do this and have this sitting on the corner of their desk, not making any noise or on a shelf near your desk. So that's why they're fun. That's where they're interesting to do. And you learn a little bit about hardware engineering uh, while you're doing all this because over time you get closer and closer to the sensors. So fun stuff. Uh, that's it for today. Um, thank you very much. We're at the top of the hour. Um, I'm looking at Julia and Kripa. Uh, Julia is our VMware Code Community Manager. Thank you to her for organizing these talks and working with that. If you're interested in do doing a talk, to our 20,000 person community, uh, reach out to Kripa and uh, she will she will happily set you up and put you on the schedule. Uh, at the same time, thanks to Julia Klaus for uh, doing the live streaming of this. And uh, again, uh, join code, you get the mailer. We have four sessions coming out through throughout May. Uh, love to see you online and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much.